Okay, so I have slides, but I'm not going to use them because as is the case with many lawyer slides, they're adding zero value to what I'm actually going to say. So we're just going to let those be an outline for me for my own uh, spoken remarks. So um, first of all, what I want to lead with is, as you can tell from the way that everyone's described their clinics and the way that these students are describing their experience, you're so lucky to be at a law school that has so many clinics that do so many different things, and you really can't go wrong with any of them. So my only advice to you as someone who did not do a clinic when I was a student here is please do one. Um, I really, once I got into practice, wish I had done one. So that's my, my pre 10 minute remarks disclaimer. Um, so innovation clinic are, we're a little bit of the ugly stepchild of this particular session because all, none of our clients are indigent um, and none of them are in immediate peril. Uh, they are all high growth startups and venture capital firms who are seeking to do something really disruptive in their particular industries. For those groups of clients, we do two main buckets of work. Uh, one bucket is transactional work and one bucket is regulatory. Uh, on the transactional work, it's not as important to me as the director of the clinic that this startup is disruptive. What's really important to me is that the transactional work they're bringing to us is something interesting. So if it's a, if it's a kind of work that the startup needs, you will probably get an opportunity to work on it as part of this clinic. So that will cover things like founders agreements and entity formations, uh, giving equity to anyone and everyone who needs or wants it that the startup wants to give it to, fundraising documents like seed stage fundraising, safes, convertible notes, um, all the way up to a series A. We do IP licenses. And the interesting thing about most of the transactional work that we do, and this IP license is a good example of this, um, is that it's not really the sort of plain vanilla off the shelf type of thing uh, that you might see in other contexts because of the kind of work that the startups are doing. Um, so on the IP licenses, one that we did this quarter was for a company called Immersion Ed. Their idea is to take video games that grade school children already play all the time, uh, things like Call of Duty, for example, just one household name. The people who make Call of Duty give them that game and then our client strips out a lot of violent parts and replaces them with educational modules um, that are sort of tailored to each grade level, then licenses out that technology and that product to K through 12 schools for use in schools um, to make especially virtual learning a lot more engaging and a lot more fun. Um, so much more complicated than just your straightforward like Microsoft Word license to a school. Uh, we also do a lot of terms of service and privacy policies, again, uh, a lot of things that are kind of the out of the ordinary. So we did one this year um, for one of my favorite startups, which is making full stack cross layer uh, quantum software. Probably means nothing to most of you in the room, uh, but if you, to put it in kind of classical computing terms, it means that this, if, whether you have a Mac or a PC, this software works with both, this operating system environment, uh, which is quite important because we don't know yet what kind of a uh, computer will win the quantum race and be most commercializable. Um, so again, something where uh, that kind of a terms of service is not going to be the same as what you see on a lot of websites right now. Uh, so suffice to say, pretty much anything transactional that a startup needs, we will do that. Uh, the more, I, I, it's all interesting, but at least to me, the more interesting part of our work is the regulatory side, and that's where we're really working specifically with disruptive companies. Um, that can take three different flavors. The first one is uh, these companies that are trying to do something disruptive that could really help the world that are being idiosyncratically prevented from doing so by regulatory hurdles. Uh, one example of this is we represented a company called Diptera. Uh, they were making sterilized mosquitoes. Essentially, what you do is you take these mosquitoes when they're in the larval phase, you expose them to low levels of radiation. This makes them unable to reproduce. And then when you release them out into the world, these sterilized male mosquitoes that can only mate once uh, attempt to mate with a female mosquito who can mate multiple times, but they're all sterile. So they die and they fail and mosquitoes don't reproduce. Uh, you might say, mosquitoes are annoying, but why do we care? Why is this good for the world? Um, this is because of climate change. The United States will be in the band of the world that actually has malaria carrying mosquitoes probably in the next 15 to 20 years. Um, so we all care much more deeply about mosquitoes pretty soon than just this is a really annoying itchy bite on my leg. And their issue was uh, based on the way that a lot of our federal and state agencies define 
these various terms, it wasn't clear to them if they were a pesticide and thus should be regulated by the EPA, if they were an agricultural pest and thus should be regulated by the USDA, um, or if they were actually a medical device that should be regulated by the FDA. And then no matter which pathway they chose, um, it wasn't clear how they would actually get that approval because you can't really do a clinical trial to get this approved like you would with the FDA. You can't really test the efficacy of this the way that the EPA says pesticides have to be treated. Um, and so very difficult pathway for them to actually get to market and do something that we all want them to do. So that's the kind of uh, regulatory work that really is our bread and butter. A couple of other different kinds of regulatory work we do. Um, some that's kind of generally applicable in a sense uh, not like data privacy when people call me and say, hey, can you tell me how to comply with GDPR? I say, uh, no, there's a lot of lawyers that already know how to do that, uh, and you can go hire one of them. Um, I want us to do things that no one's thought of. So one example uh, this year that students did is there's a new law called the Corporate Transparency Act that requires small businesses well, any non-public business subject to a number of exceptions to file an ownership statement saying who all the people are who own and control that company. Um, this has to be filed with the Department of Treasury. And when the proposed rules came out, there were a lot of ways in which the rules, the way that they're currently drafted by FinCEN, make no sense for startups and are in fact absolutely impossible for startups to comply with. So the students put together a comment letter to that as part of FinCEN's notice and comment rulemaking on this, uh, on these rules they're promulgating under the Corporate Transparency Act, explaining to FinCEN all the ways in which they would need to change the language of the proposed statute in order to make it work uh, from a practical standpoint for more small businesses while still serving their goal of com combating money laundering and things like that. Uh, and then there's kind of an other bucket of regulatory work. So one interesting thing we're doing in that category at the moment um, is there's a major international law firm who realized that they were getting approached more and more often by crypto clients to do non-crypto work. And they really didn't have a good sense of how to advise those clients because they weren't familiar with the industry. So my students have actually been putting together a series of guides for that law firm to help educate their attorneys about how crypto works, what it is, how their different practice areas might need to be cognizant of what's going on with crypto. Uh, and they will eventually uh, go do a series of presentations at that law firm uh, in person to help educate them on that. Um, so one of the best things, I guess, for me uh, about being in the innovation clinic, if you're a student, uh, is that entrepreneurs that we're working with are often just as naive about these sorts of things as you are. And there's really no expert out there who can give them an answer because the kinds of questions that they're asking us are questions that no one actually has considered or knows the answer to yet. As a result, that gives you a really good opportunity as a student to learn about something that's not well trod ground at all. And also, uh, you know, they say the best test of whether you've understood something is if you can actually teach someone else and explain it. That's pretty much what you have to do every single time you get on the phone or a call with an entrepreneur. Um, these people are incredibly talented, brilliant people in the fields that they're in. They're groundbreaking scientists. A lot of them are on the faculty here at U of C. They just don't get the law stuff at all. And they really need somebody to help them kind of take their business, excuse me, uh, take their business to the next level. Um, my approach to clinical teaching for all of you is sort of teach someone how to fish. Uh, my goal is that we do a lot of work before we hop on the phone with a client that then enables you to sort of be in the driver's seat as far as the client is concerned, um, so that their impression is that you're sort of doing it all and I'm a light touch, even though in the background, I'm probably a heavier touch than what the client thinks that I'm doing. Um, so I, my goal is for all of you to be able to hold yourself out as experts to the client. Um, the result is that often our clients actually wanna hire our students to come work for them full-time uh, after graduation. And then you end up getting to see a client you know, through its life cycle across various different projects that you do for them to uh, this year, we finally had a client now that we've been doing this for a few years that had an exit and sold to a strategic acquirer. Uh, so my students got to work on that M&A deal as well. Um, so I think this is a great clinic to do if you're interested in transactional work or if you're interested in any kind of regulatory practice. Um, even if you're going to be a litigator, a lot of our regulatory work takes a very litigation feel. Um, so if you want to be the kind of person that can sort of be a really great generalist, all things to a client, uh, this is a really great clinic for you. Thank <laughs> you.